Welcome everybody to the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce Focus Friday. This morning, we uh, have Elaine Powell, who is our District 1 County Commissioner, and Eileen Joyce from the Small Business Administration. This is a program of the Lake Norman Chamber. It's presented by Novant Health Huntersville Medical Center and our partners at Business Today, Cornelius Today, and WSIC. Jeff Tart will be facilitating today's program. He is our 2020 Public Policy Chair. And Jeff, I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Bill, thank you, everybody. Welcome uh, this morning. Uh, we're all getting used to this new virtual meeting uh, format, but let's just kind of jump into things this morning. I'm gonna start, and you've introduced people, Bill. Uh, Eileen Joyce is with us. She's the lead person for uh, the uh, Small Business Administration. Uh, your organization is getting a lot of attention and activity right now. And Elaine, we've had you on before, or Eileen, and we thank you uh, for being here. And I wanna give you the floor first, because I know you have a few things you wanted to cover. So uh, if you will take the lead, we'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you so much. Um, can I, do I flip the slides or do you, Bill? I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip the slide. Okay, great. Well, it's been a busy two weeks. We have uh, made a lot of uh, paycheck protection loans in North Carolina. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the news that the paycheck protection program has run out of um, appropriated funds. We are waiting to see if Congress will appropriate some more funds and that program could be reopened. The uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which we refer to as EIDL, um, has is also been affected by the lack of appropriations. Uh, they are telling me that if you have um, entered your information into EIDL and you have a confirmation number, you are in the queue and you should be good. Um, so that's a good thing. So. The, the EIDL program is moving forward with the people who are in the system. They should be getting their uh, advances uh, timely after they receive some information from SBA and then the uh, loan process will come through. It's been taking a while. Um, I haven't talked to too many people who have gotten their funding. Normally I just hear from people who haven't received funding yet. They don't circle back and let me know that they got it. But I did hear back from a few people that they did get their funding, so that's good. And they are getting their advances uh, deposited into their checking account. So that is moving forward. Um, in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, um, I, I, while the banks are catching up with uh, their paperwork, if this is a program that you had applied for, it would be a great time to reach out to your lender uh, to see you know, how you can get the Paycheck Protection Program should it reopen. Um, so that it would be a good time to do that would be now. We just started uh, working with the lenders who have SBA loans with, um, through us. So if you have an SBA loan, a current loan through your lender, not a disaster loan, but a regular business loan, uh, there is debt relief offered through the stimulus package. So six months of your loan payment will be paid by SBA. And if you have a recent SBA loan, again, not a disaster loan, but a, a business loan, uh, the next six months will be covered by SBA. So that's a good thing. Um, I just wanted to share too with people that um, while our programs are on pause, uh, for the sole proprietors and the independent contractors, as part of the debt, um, I'm sorry, as part of the stimulus package, money was given to the state's employment uh, security departments to provide unemployment insurance to those individuals. And according to the state's website, they uh, should be starting this next Friday. So there, that's something uh, for your independent contractors and sole proprietors to, to seek out. But I did want to share that in North Carolina, and this is as of um, April 13th, I don't have current information yet, uh, we did um, almost 24,000 
loans in the Paycheck Protection Program for over $5.7 billion in North Carolina. It's a big number. It is. We're a big state. Eileen, a couple of questions. One, the $350 million that was allocated for the disaster relief, that is the monies that have been allocated and exhausted. Correct. Is, is the regular business loan program still operational? Or are, are you still accepting applications on that? Yes. Um, however, the lenders that normally make the SBA guaranteed loans at their banks are the ones who have been working feverishly in the Paycheck Protection Program. So um, I have talked to a couple people that have businesses that are really not affected by the disaster mm -hmm. so much, and they're trying to pursue getting regular bank loans, but it's hard to move forward on that because lenders are so consumed with uh, the other side of the situation. Does it make a difference from your guys' perspective to use a preferred lender, a bank that can approve an SBA loan internally versus one that will have to come back through you guys? Um, it goes faster if you use a preferred lender. Okay. Um, we don't care. Gotcha. We work with every lender that wants to do business with us. And one of the most interesting things that has come out um, because of this uh, situation is we've signed up several new lenders that had been sitting on the sidelines not wanting to participate with SBA, but they have signed up and, and actually made uh, a couple of the paycheck protection loans, which is Excellent. awesome. So now they're, now they're going to be in the, in the queue to make business loans going forward. Well, we've been in the program for a few weeks, I guess now. Any kind of lessons learned and kind of tips and techniques on how to navigate this process? Is assuming additional monies do get allocated. Oh man, um, that's a really hard one to say because it all depends on your lender. And it, in, in a lot of the, the reasons why you choose the lender you did is because of the type of business that you are. You know, if you're um, in manufacturing, you need a, a, a bank that can handle that type of, of invoicing and um, payroll and you may need a bank that has a whole lot more services than a smaller bank. Um, it's hard to say about lessons learned because this is a, an unprecedented uh, initiative that was taken on in relatively few days. For, from the SBA's perspective, Eileen, what are the big issues you guys are encountering and running up against other than lack of money? <laughs> um, uh, on my end, because I'm, I've been monitoring uh, the emails and the phone calls for the office, um, it's just a lot of frustration on the part of the business owner who is having trouble uh, getting through to their bank. Um, the uh, banks are some banks aren't being responsive. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know what to do. They don't have the proper paperwork. They didn't file their taxes. So a lot of it is is on the you know on the shoulders of the business owner. And uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do with that right now. I am referring people over to the Small Business and Technology Development Center, uh, to the Women's Business Center, uh, to SCORE. Uh, those counselors can help people uh, get their paperwork together, um, make sure that they've got everything in order, help them out, um, so that when they talk to their lender, the, the lender can move forward faster. And you're hitting on a key point. And I, and I've businesses that I'm associated with. Uh, one has applied that we do some consulting work and one hasn't, but isn't there a formula that you determine the amount you're eligible for tied to like your total costs, operating costs? And if so, is that the kind of material you have to have prepared? And if you have some ideas, I know you mentioned having documents that ready, but what would those be or information? Well, it depends on, on if you're going for the idle or the paycheck protection. So Can obviously- you, Again, the, real quickly, kind of differentiate the two. Sure. The idle loan program comes directly from SBA and the paycheck program comes directly from your bank. And you can only apply for one, correct? No, you can apply for both. Okay, good. It just, it, um, it can be a little complicated if you do, um, but it is, it is possible. Um, there's a lot of information on the Treasury's website that explains a lot of this, 
but it's very detail oriented and very um, very lengthy um, that goes into the process. And, and most business owners don't want to uh, read all that legalese. Sure. So, um, you know, obviously our, the bankers have, and so they're the ones that are equipped to help you explain what you need to do for your PPP loan. Gotcha. Um, SBA's idle loan program is a little different in that um, because of the just the, the surge in the number of people applying and the fact that the system crashed and now the system has been set up more in a, in a multi-stage process where you're going to get your, um, your advance first and you'll get communication from SBA and then you'll get your loan information. So that process is a little bit longer, but people are getting their funding. So it will happen. It's just, it, I, I, I understand everyone's frustrations, sure. but there are 30 million small businesses in the United States. And I think all of them are applying at the same time. So, I'm going to go back to the, it, it, his first question. I'm going to go back to the other one, which I kind of took you off path and I apologize. What, how do you guys, what is the definition of a small business? What are the criteria to qualify as quote, a small business? Is there such? Yes. Uh, it's actually based on government contracting standards because the, in when, whether you're a military base or you're the EPA, uh, they have goals to meet for, uh, buying from small businesses. So it's very all over the place. Um, there's not just a hard and fast, you know, 500 mm -hmm. employees over or under. It all depends on what you do. If you're in manufacturing, it's going to be employee based. If you're in service, it's going to be sales based. Um, and for the most part, most all businesses are small. And um, that's why most people are applying. And it, it is, it is uh, there's some frustration from some people who think that a lot of the bigger businesses um, are taking advantage of the programs, but they are actually small businesses that are applying. Now back to the question I apologize, I took you off path from, is there a checklist or basic information, costs, you know, your expenses that businesses need to have ready when they apply? I have not seen that list. I would imagine that's something that the lender is, would ask for in the paperwork. Okay, good enough. And I, I know there was for a while, people were experiencing difficulty navigating the website and stuff if they were kind of processing things online. Is that still occurring or is that been- you know, that's what caused the, Yeah, that's what caused the system to crash because they were going through the process like it was a normal uh, hurricane or tornado situation. Mm -hmm. um, so they stopped asking for all that information and just got the bare basics to get you in the queue. From the queue, you got your advance. And then after that, you got the, the, the email saying, you know, we need, you know, copies of your tax returns. We need copies of this. We need copies of that. And SBA determines how much uh, you're going to receive based on those documents. Good. And that's for the idle loan program. Okay. Uh, kind of the last question I had for you before we uh, jump over to Elaine. Uh, Eileen, is, is the SBA looking at or monitoring or modeling uh, or concerned about foreclosures, uh, bankruptcies, and what's what are you seeing? And well, that's always uh, a, a concern because we hope everybody uh, makes prudent business decisions uh, based on their financial situation. Um, we rely on lenders to uh, monitor their clients, and that would be under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but, you know, the goal is that you will pay back your SBA loans. If now under the PPP, if you spend the money the right way, a lot of your loan will be waived, if not all of it. If you spend it on, on payroll, as outlined in the directions, you could have the whole loan waived. Gotcha, that makes sense. Well, any closing thoughts, last thoughts for everyone? Oh, just wanted to thank everybody for uh, their patience in this process. It's um, been a lot for, for everybody. We are working as hard as we can to work with our banks to get uh, them up to speed. 
Um, we're trying to get information out to business owners uh, as soon as we can. Um, we just, uh, we're waiting right now to see if more appropriations come through and then we'll be right back at it. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. I know your office is slammed. Uh, you're, you're about as in demand as the uh, healthcare providers right now. And in a sense, you are a healthcare provider to our businesses. So we tip our hat and thank you for everything that you do for all of us. Well, thank you. You bet. All right, next up on the agenda is Miss Elaine Powell. In full disclosure, uh, Elaine and I have been friends, gosh, now for maybe almost two decades. We uh, served together on the Mecklenburg County Park and Rec uh, Department. Uh, this is a lady I have high regard for and is somebody who truly cares about what's going on in Mecklenburg County. Elaine, it is a pleasure to have you join us this morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, I wanna say a couple things uh, before we start. Uh, Floor is yours and I know you've got some material to cover and I'll just turn it over yeah. to you and then when uh, you've covered the material that you've brought, uh, I know you are totally uh, slammed as well uh, sitting in the role that you do and the fact that you could join us this morning uh, representing the county and all the things going on. Uh, we are really looking forward to getting an update from you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, it's an important time for people to hear from their elected leaders. In June last year, I had a flood in, in District 1 um, down here in North Charlotte. And I had the opportunity to work with emergency operations. And there was a lot of frustration back then where, that I learned uh, that is helping me now. Um, it's extremely important and number one priority from the citizens to have clear, consistent communication. And so it's number one. And then when we had our emergency management presentation at our retreat this year, um, we talked about that again how important this communication is. And so that is why I brought this slide set. Um, this is what we received at the Board of County Commissioners on this Tuesday. And because things are changing so quickly, some of the information has changed already. But I'd like to go through it. You know, like the slide that just came up, it says case 992. Last night it was 10, 1,098 and the deaths had risen to 21. And so you'll see other changes on here, like this graph has gone up, it keeps going up, so we have not hit a peak yet. But um, if you go to the next slide, you'll- Total cases will always go up. Yeah, right. And That's not the peak you're looking for. Who is talking? Dr. That's Mike. Dr. Mike Miltick. Okay. I thought we were all muted. All right. Um, he, he will be muted now. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But yeah. Well, yours. I've, known him, I've known him since the 80s. So uh, we won't had... hold that against him. <laughs> so this is the information provided by um, the public health director. And, and maybe everyone is already aware of this, but I just want to go over it so that everybody does have the same information. About three in four of the reported cases were eight adults aged 20 to 59. And so there's some misconception that it's really impacting older people, which they do have uh, more serious complications, but three and four are between the ages of 20 to 59. That is significant. Elaine, do you know whether we've had any deaths below 60 though? I know they have in New York, but I did not think we did here, do you know? Well, it says on this slide, 12 deaths, um, the, all the deaths were among older adults. Right, okay. With underlying, so, but it's still important to know that, I mean, everybody, if you've seen the news once, you know that people are dying between the ages of 20 and 59. Um, two reported cases were children in Mecklenburg County that were less than one year old. About one in five of the reported cases were hospitalized due to the virus while well, everyone is at risk and we and we really want people to know everyone is at risk it's an equal opportunity virus um, 
the reported cases who were in older adults were four times more likely to have to go to the hospital. More than half of the reported cases have met the CDC criteria to be released from isolation. That's a question we get quite often. Um, how many have recovered? And then again, the 12 deaths at the time on Tuesday when we got this slide presentation, uh, they were older adults greater than 60 and two thirds were male and half were non-Hispanic blacks, which is also a concern that I keep hearing about disproportionate impact. And I think it's important to note too that all the ones that I think the deaths all had underlying conditions, which was on your slide, but that's an important point to note. Yes, and then here are the hospitalization rates um, on Tuesday. And so you see um, the, the young people that have hit, been hit by this, 11% are hospitalized, 5% between 20 and 39, and then 17% between 40 and 59. So every, every age group has some hospitalization rates. Yeah, a number that's kind of scary when you get into that is those going into uh, ICUs and going on ventilators. I know we've been talking about it. I believe in Mecklenburg County, we're running about 23 to 24% use of available equipment. So we've still got, we've got the ability to handle the peak. The survival rates on once you go on a ventilator though with the elderly across the country has been, it, it's, it's a sad, dramatic number. I mean, I think the number in Mecklenburg is about a 25% survival rate. I know you, New York's only about 15%. So it's very scary when it gets that point in time. It is very scary. And, and I was talking to family last night. I don't know if a lot of, if you have never worked in healthcare and you're not familiar with what it means to, to be on a vent um, and how many people are involved in your care uh, you, you don't understand the, the desperate situation of when you have so many people requiring such special care, how hard that is on the healthcare system. Sure. Just, one person requires such a large team once they're on a vent. And I think that's important for people, you know, if you've never worked in healthcare, just know that it's a, it's a big stress to have someone on a vent. Hmm. Yeah, I know an old statistic, and this is old, and Mike would probably know it. We can talk about it a little bit later. But on an average uh, three-day length of stay in a hospital, you see 150 different people touch you. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, all right, we'll let you go on through the material, if you will. Okay. And so if you want to go on to the next slide, Bill. This is just to show, um, you know, how dense the cases are. But really, I mean, just... This is what we know. There are, there's so much we don't know. So just assume that uh, you, you will be exposed if you're not following the guidelines. I'm getting some questions on this, um, you know, about how are you creating the projections? So it's a team of people working together on emergency operations every day and they are relying on modeling from the University of Pennsylvania. And, and do, you know, do you have any uh, idea or know how the UPenn model was selected? And then corollary question is, are you looking at multiple models or just the UPenn model? So I am not on the emergency operations team, but I am told that they are looking at multiple models, but they, they have chosen this model for this county um, because they think it is the most reliable based on multiple factors. And I can get you a document on that, on all the reasons why they have chosen this. Mm -hmm. But I am, you know, I was not part of, of choosing that model. Sure. Um, I'm just curious and I think people get curious and others And I think it's just part of human nature, like people want this to be over. And so um, our emergency operations wants to make sure that the number one priority is to protect public health and safety. 
And so they're doing their best to do that. And, and this is what all of them have come up with. And then when you look at the policy team who's, who meets every morning at 10 a.m. Um, and people say, well, I thought it was hundreds of people. Well, you know, when you have one county manager, she represents, I mean, she, many, many people are feeding into the, the input she's giving. And it's the same for everyone else on the task force. Uh, they're fed by many, many professionals and experts on this, which is a good thing. So the committee might not look gigantic, but it's, it's fed by hundreds of people. And is this committee making uh, recommendations to the commissioners and the full board or where, where, what are they doing with the information they glean? Well, they do share it, but they have the authority. Um, in a local state of emergency, they have the, uh, the director of public health has the authority to make these decisions. But so, that, has, that has to be granted by either the, by the board. The board, she can't circumvent the board by law. So, I mean, you guys have given her that authority, so it's understood. But then so are you letting her implement the decisions of this group or is she looking at other groups as well? All of that, all of the um, ordinances, laws that give her that authority were, mm -hmm. in, place, were in place well before 2020. Sure. Of course. And so in this local state of emergency, she does have the authority in a public health pandemic. Um, and so she can't decide how we spend money, but she has the uh, ultimate authority with the chairman's signature to, um, to make decisions. And so when we, rec we received the stay-at-home order, we were not part of creating it, we received it. And same for the other day, um, we received information and that we were extending Mecklenburg County to match with the governor. We just received it. There was no vote on that. It was unnecessary. Gotcha. We did not vote on it. Okay. Um, but really, this just explains uh, how, you know, how these projections are created. And mm -hmm. the public health director really wanted to make sure people knew it was it's not exact, it's not perfect. And it's like forca forecasting a hurricane and she keeps saying that. So there will be new for forecasts as we get more data and see more trends and it changes daily. And so that's why they are having so many media briefings. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what are the cur current projections tell us? We have significant community spread. And if you are looking at a map of North Carolina, we are the hot spot. We haven't had a dramatic acceleration in cases, which is a good thing. Um, we are flattening the curve. Uh, and then you'll see in the next slides, uh, we're flattening it, it out to where uh, the peak is farther along than we expected. Like I thought we'd be in the peak right now. And so it was a big surprise the other day to hear that we are in gonna, the peak is gonna come in mid-June, they think. Yeah, it depends on the model. The University of Washington model actually forecasts that we're starting the peak now. The UNC model, which Duke and UNC are running, projects us in uh, mid-May. So again, I think the UPenn is the most conservative um, and pushes it, like you said, out into mid-June, but it, it, it's an outlier compared to probably eight other models. Which is and I have looked, yeah, I have looked at the other ones. And so we are asking questions. Um, and that is part of a really important part of our role right now is to make sure, sure that we are looking at all the data, uh, really listening to citizen concerns and responding to them and making sure that they are heard. Are you pretty fairly confident or what's the information? Because as the curve flattens, the peak shifts out but it seems like we're building that gap, which is the whole concept between peak and healthcare capacity, beds and stuff. We saw Atrium and Novant no longer are requesting building the 600 bed field hospital, at least for now. So are you getting information that talks to our ability to stay under, you know, the peak exceeding the capacity of our health system? 
We do receive information, but it's, it's with, we receive it when the public receives it. So not like I get it in advance. And um, it, it has been surprising to me to go from needing a 3,000 bed field hospital to uh, 600. And now they're saying they've increased bed capacity, but they say, make no mistake. If, if, the re if you lift the restrictions without thinking through them. Sure. Yeah, like make no mistake that we have to think through uh, how, how we lift the restrictions. But if, if uh, uh, Elaine, what you're saying is the county board will not be that decision body for lifting the stay at home order at this point. Is that correct? That is correct. And so you're, you're kind of listening and getting this information the same as the rest of us. I might get it two or three minutes before. Um, before it's publicly released, but not very, I mean, it's very short time. Does, maybe, we're, and I'm not, and we'll come back. I don't want to uh, not allow you to finish the slides. I want to go through those, but a couple quick questions that will help us then with this information, does that factor in decisions? Like I know we closed the boat ramps. Uh, we're dealing with things like no longer allowing cars in the park. How are, what's the basis for making those kind of decisions? Can you walk us through how that happens and what the thought process and decision processes are for those things. So um, I'm glad you asked because I've had difficulty with this as well um, in North Mecklenburg because we had so many people who were compliant uh, and, and I feel like they were punished. Um, it's it just hard because the rest, especially at Freedom Park, there was so much non-compliance and you know, Jeff, since we served on the Park Commission, we know that ever, as long as you can remember, Freedom has had difficulty with overcrowding. And so I feel like maybe some decisions were made based on what they were seeing at Freedom Park and a few other parks, but not what was happening in North Mecklenburg. So this is really hard, but I will tell you the thinking. They think that, um, you know, Lee Jones, Director of Park and Rec. Lee's a great guy, really good guy. Yes. And so these decisions were take, not taken lightly at all. And he has all the recommendations and guidelines from the National Recreation and Park Association mm -hmm. about how to keep crowds from forming. And they, they meet every day, you know, as well as emergency operations meeting every day. He meets nationally with these people every day. And they said, if you only close a few parks because of the noncompliance, then they go to the they go to the other parks, and so then we would have crowding. And really, what we're trying to avoid in a stay-at-home pandemic is crowding. Um, so this is why they made the decision, and they just made it across the board. We're going to close the parking lots so that only pedestrians and bicycles can access it. Mm. And. And that, that's how they made the decision based on what they've seen in other states. Um, and, and when he is on the telephone call with the National Parks and Recreation Association, he's talking nationally, especially to urban areas right now. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it in other counties throughout the United States, especially where there's a at-risk senior population. Okay. And here are some graphs that just, uh, based on the University of Pennsylvania modeling, Right. It really looks like uh, they think our peak, and from what I've heard, based on this, the peak would be June 8th. Unless we do better social distancing. And I can tell you, I can hear 485 right now from the window I'm sitting near. And I don't, I don't think people are staying at home because I can hear 485 and I couldn't hear it last week. It sounds just like it sounded in February. Well, and picking up on that concept a little bit, do you guys, can, can you explain or do you know how essential versus non-essential work businesses get designated, who makes that decision? Because obviously, whoever's driving in theory should be all essential workers going to work, healthcare providers, police officers. So that's a really good question because we get so many phone calls and, and it's interesting. Um, so many phone calls from people saying, oh, we're essential. We are essential. 
and all the reasons they're, they're essential. And then we're getting employees calling saying, you know, my employer's putting me at risk. You need to close this down. You need to close grocery stores down. It should be drive through only. And so we're getting, you can't see my hands, but we're getting both sides of everything. Sure. And it's, it's like an avalanche of people on each side, uh, you know, saying that they're essential and then other people saying, no, it's not essential. You should rope, you like, they should on, people are telling us they should only have aisles open at Lowe's where they have essential products. Like, and so I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of things. <laughs> the one thing, and, and I don't know if you know this, but I understand the entity, the organization, the person who makes the essential, non-essential decisions is the emergency management department in this case. Is it true that it's actually been removed out of the counties and it's at Mike Sprayberry's the uh, state director's level at this point for designations? Is that true or not? Do you know? So as far as I know, it's still up to each county. Okay. And because we are the hot spot for the state of North Carolina, we are more restrictive. And um, that is chose, that, that's all decided by the emergency operations team. And so because I've received so many requests for um, requests for people to say, please excuse me from this restriction, um, we are sending them all to the county attorney. To, we have to have a place to send them because we're getting sure. so many. So we're sending them to the county attorney for review. Gotcha. And do you have a sense, is the UPIN model going to be the determinant or that committee to determine when restrictions get relaxed or other things that might get tightened? I, I don't think that the peak date is there. So the county manager is, is saying that that will not determine stay at home order. Um, it, so I know that there was a lot of anxiety. It was a shock for us to see this graph on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. and that is not going to be the sole predictor of when the stay at home order ends. Okay, and here's and the distinction I'd like to make, because I think we do this almost to a fault. We, and I say we, the public, is when we say re, re, uh, lighten uh, restrictions and stuff or reduce them. I separate the stay at home order from the things we're continuing to tweak. Like I said, when we uh, no longer allowed people to drive into parks, when we've decided to restrict the number of people going into stores, those and, and social distancing, what I call the COVID-19 hygiene rules, social distancing, masks, uh, cleansing, sanitizing hands, washing hands, those things are from just the pure stay-at-home order. So if we take the stay-at-home order and say that's going to be a determination in and of itself, are there things that are on the table at the county level to either start loosening the restrictions on, i.e. being able to go to a restaurant, being able to increase the number of people in a store to allow you to redrive into a park. And the other flip side of that coin is, are there things you're considering to tighten further at the county level? Again, it's, it's, um, it, is, it won't be our choice, but we are pushing. So every single time somebody contacts me, I take their input and, and you can tell what is really important to the population by the number of messages you're getting. Um, and so I hope that, and I'm asking for this, when we start to lift restrictions, please, you know, please let us have the parking lots open again to our boat ramps, mm. to our parks, you know, after, serving together how important these areas are for people for health and wellness and especially at this time with you know just to be in green space at this time and so we are pushing well, i am i'm pushing for please do this because i think it's a really important part and then you know k 
can we start to open small businesses? Mm -hmm. Can we start to open them in a whole different way? Even if it was every other table, how, you know, how can we do this? Even if it's just families. And so I love when I get emails from people who say, I have this idea for my business. You know, I own this gym and I have this idea of how to do everything differently. And I'll just have certain, you know, people will have to sign up in advance and then we'll clean the equipment, but they just want to stay in business. And so I love these solution oriented emails. I'd love to get more people that have solutions on how we can do this together because it's a situation that is so unique and we need to all work together to figure it out. Uh, so we are pushing for that. Like I'm getting really good emails about uh, how people want to play tennis and they'll sure. say how they're going to keep from other people from touching it. So can they have family lessons, especially in your neighborhood, Jeff, I'm hearing a lot of people ask, they just like to have private lessons with the pro or play and, with your spouse. Yes. Okay. And so right. they would like, for us to lift those kind of restrictions. And a lot of them are so common sense. And so we are pushing for that. Great. And so hopefully the decision makers will take all of what we're pushing for into, into account when they're making decisions. You've got this information on testing. You wanna walk us through this? This is- Yeah, we're doing everything we can to increase testing. Um, Novant and Atrium have helped to go into areas where um, people have a, a long history of being underserved. And so, um, there will be, actually it's already started on Eastway Drive, Oakland Avenue, Beatty's Ford Road, and Executive Center Drive. So those have all started. Um, and it is still difficult because we still don't have the supplies we need, but I have, um, I know that we're doing everything we can to increase, test, increase capacity, expand sites, and address supply challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, we're trying to get messaging out to key populations where we're seeing significant virus complications, the African American community in uh, people who are older than 60 with underlying health conditions. Again, we talked about it earlier, the largest number affected are people between 20 and 59. And we really just want to encourage people to, you know, stay at home. If you have to go out, please wear a mask. Um, stay at least six feet away, even if you have a mask on. And, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people walking on the greenways. Um, if you are, if you even think a jogger is going to run by, I would wear a mask. So um, it can't hurt. You yeah, know, you I've, don't want I've, seen, yeah. I've seen data on even bike riders and stuff that mm -hmm. you need to have like three to four times the distance because as they drive by, they have kind of a wind stream they can carry the spittle, if you will, in. So it's dangerous. Yeah. So I would just encourage people, you know, all people older than two years old to, you know, wear a homemade mask uh, or a bandana or a scarf. Uh, I think it can't hurt. Any provisions or guidance or what are you hearing with our nursing homes? Anything particular there? Because I know statewide, it's a, that's been a real problem area. Over 72 nursing homes have cases and outbreaks. And it's getting worse. Um, I don't know if you read about the autumn care in Cornelius, but uh, they have some COVID cases that I, would, mm -hmm. I heard on the news from Joe Bruno. And um, so it is a, it's a place of concern. They've had them shut off from the public for quite some time. And so mm. it's a place that, you know, the director of public health is really, and her, her team is really looking into these places to decrease the risk of exposure and make sure everybody has PPE. But it is surprising to see what uh, was reported last night on the news. I mean, it would be difficult and a challenge but even when we lift the stay at home order, I think you, there's data that might support keeping the nursing homes, you know, restricted. Yes. At risk populations, I think will mm -hmm. be restricted. Longer. Yes. Yeah. That's what we're hearing today. Uh, there will be a t toolkit town hall 
at 11 o'clock and um, county staff will be ha have this toolkit available for everyone. Um, they're saying it's for uh, an underserved population, but I think it's, it's an important tool for everyone because they'll have mental health resources on there and multiple other um, frequently asked questions, the answers to the frequently asked questions. On the business side of things, since we are the chamber and mm -hmm. you've got the county business to run, what impact do you, are you guys being told from a budget shortfall, you know, revenue shortfall impacts on budget? Can you address that a little bit? What's the discussion? We have received one update from the chief financial officer and at the end of, uh, at the end of her presentation, she just said, count on this changing. And so um, that's where we are. Has there been, cause no. I know, go ahead, I'm sorry. Get your, ask your next questions because I think it's related. I was just going to say, you know, because are we seeing with the projected unemployment levels that are going on, we have one-tenth of the state unemployed, Mecklenburg seeing that. Is that going to impact the county? Are you guys forecasting or anticipate layoffs or furloughs of, of county employees or? We have, currently the county manager has instituted a hiring freeze, but it does not, she, I'm told she does not anticipate any layoffs or furloughs at this time. No, we don't see any disruptions of county services or we're good to go so far. I don't know how well you know her. Dina? But, yeah, I don't know how well, but she, I don't think, you, you don't prepare for a global pandemic, but she was prepared for, for rough times, so that's always in her mind. You know, we need to be ready in case of an emergency. I know she's caught a little bit of flack uh, recently on an issue or two, but I've known Dina pretty well, and, and we had her on last session, and I tell you, she's a rock star. So we're very fortunate to have her leading the ship. I think a little bit of it was around even the Gibby Harris hire and stuff, but those things happen, as we all know, occasionally from time to time. Well, mm -hmm. yes. There's, there's always criticism, no matter what decision you make, especially as an elected leader uh, or a county government, there's, there's always um, criticism. Any other things you want to cover or leave us with, Elaine, before we let everybody get to the weekend? Well, a couple things. Um, we do, we approved $5 million worth of um, small business stabilization loans on Tuesday. These are for businesses from zero that have less than 50 employees. They must be located in Mecklenburg County and they must have two years of um, prof profitable operation. And this slide will be available for everyone. I hope, I think it'll be part of Bill's presentation that he, that he has recorded. Um, the loan amount can be between 5,000 to $35,000. And then you, you can see all the rest of the terms. The micro business loan is for businesses under five, five and under employees. And the loan can be up to $10,000. And if it's used for eligible expenses, that will be totally forgiven. So that's the micro business. The small business will, um, it has to be repaid because the county government cannot be in the business of, of lend, lending dollars. And so, we have a third party that'll be in charge of all this and those loans will have to be repaid. One question, I don't know if you've heard this, Tark Bakari on the Charlotte City Council had published a, a statistic um, that he believes if we stay in uh, lockdown or stay at home order through mid-May, we will lose 1300 micro businesses in Mecklenburg County. Is that something, has that been discussed or are you aware of that or? At, at the city level. I am very aware of it. Uh, it. These are some of the hardest phone calls I've ever had in, in my life. Um, the anguish of the micro businesses and, you know, they, they might have had enough dollars to operate for one month uh, in a, an emergency situation, but not, not beyond that. And so, um, I'm extremely well aware of that, and 
and I, my heart aches for all these business owners. And so we are thinking like, how can we help? And so even though this is, it's just a blip of, of how we can help. I think Eileen might feel the same way. It's, it's just a blip. Um, you know, but are you able to share without breaching any confidences what kind of ideas are being considered for help for that group? Well, w right now, I mean, we tried to. We're, I we're we are bouncing around so many things of how we can help um, and be effective, not just a band aid. But sure. it's so overwhelming. And so I really, I would really encourage all the small business owners who might be listening or hear this, that have ideas, that have solution-oriented input, please share it with us. Because we read all of it and we take it seriously. And, you know, I have, I have people in my family who own small businesses, restaurants, um, who have been in business for well over 30 to 40 years and have been through a lot of hard times, this is the hardest. Mm -hmm. So please, if you have solution oriented input, please send it. One last area. That, oh. Great. Go Jeff, ahead. I think that's probably why as part of the stimulus package, they gave money to the um, employment security commissions to help the sole proprietors and the independent contractors with unemployment. I mean, it's not, not a complete lifesaver, but it's hopefully something to get people through. It's a life vest for right now. Mm -hmm. Still got to get to shore. Yeah. Elaine, one last area that, I, I, and I know it's not the county board's direct responsibility, but you are the funding source. Any thoughts around or anything to share with us around the school systems? Elaine, anything there? For I think that would be better if you ask, ask the school systems. Um, okay. Yeah. I know the representatives different, especially Jennifer De La Hara would be love to come be invited to this and talk about it. Uh, and Rhonda, well, I think I'm sure they, they've got their hands full as well. Oh yeah. We all, Oh, I bet we all do. Um, I, before we hang up, I, I just want to know uh, or say, please keep sending solution-oriented input. You know, Dr. Mike asked about reopening dog parks and um, a couple of boat ramps, I think. And all of these things we take forward. We, and if there's something else, if you have an idea about something that we might not have discussed, please send that forward. And I just wanna tell you, Jeff, that this is a really, hard situation to be in as an elected leader, but I care and I want, I mean, I want to be part of helping however I can. And every day all along, you know, every time I have a free minute or free second, I just pray for unity. But we can all work together to solve problems because there are so many people that are angry and anger isn't helping. We just need to think about how we can work together. And so I just keep praying for the grace of unity at this time. Well, and no one will ever be able to question your uh, level of caring. Again, known you so doggone long and appreciate what you do. And boy, it's a tough seat to be in that you're setting in and the other commissioners and other elected officials um, doing this right now. So we appreciate your service to the community. We appreciate the time you've taken this morning. Uh, Eileen, as well, you, are, you two are both in uh, positions that have great impact on our community, on our businesses, and our families. And we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Jeff, I want to thank you for the time that you put in developing some of these questions. Uh, Mayor Washam, you're, you're on the line. I've unmuted you. Um, Wednesday, we saw uh, a little parade going down Catawba Avenue. I was here in my office and, and uh, Sally from uh, Visit Lake Norman, and we saw a parade of our law enforcement and first responders. Do you want to share a little bit about what that was? Yes, I do. It's something I'm very proud of. Uh, actually, our, our public uh, service units throughout the North Mecklenburg area uh, gathered together to honor our, our medical first line folks. 
uh, at our hospitals and some of the clinics around. Uh, and, and there was an impressive, very impressive uh, parade, if you will, of emergency vehicles going by uh, with sirens on uh, just for the honor of those uh, medical folks that are, that are working so hard. So it was, it was very heartwarming. I, I've gotten a lot of emails and, and calls and so forth uh, uh, from folks that were, were, were very, very deeply touched about that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dan Houston is also on the line. And Dan, we had a fantastic program yesterday. We have another one coming up very shortly uh, on leading through crisis. Do you want to say something about the next program and how people can register? Yeah, we have, uh, I guess we'll, we're sending out a, a notice to the list um, with a Zoom link, link to it. And what we've been doing over the last three sessions is just taking a, a quick analysis using some information from John Maxwell, who you know is a kind of leadership guru in these times of crises. Uh, but we've been taking a look at how leaders can help other people. It's, it's almost like a lot of things that Elaine is doing, um, just the way she's approaching this whole notion of crisis. And, and what we've been doing is just, just as a leadership group and business owners and people who might be in position to employ other people, who might influence other people, we've been looking at ways, very practical ways, that number one, that we can take care of ourselves. Number two, that we have a, a certain mindset. And number three, that we give hope to people and not dismay. So we got one more session left, and I, I believe that's Tuesday at uh, lunchtime, this coming Tuesday, the 21st, at lunch. and. Uh, the whole public is is welcome and bring a lunch, go to a, a a restaurant, buy lunch, give a heavy tip, and come on in and we'll we'll zoom we'll zoom you into um, it's been really good. We've had good uh, discussion and and we've been able to break it to small groups and spend a little bit of time just talking and airing some of the issues we're both concerned with, but also issues that uh, that will help our community. So yeah. Thank you for leading that too, Bill. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a fantastic program. Um, this program has been recorded. We'll be placing that on our website later on today and we'll be getting that out. We've also created a business resource guide. Uh, we're gonna publish that to the website too. Um, it's a, it's a, a compendium of all of the resources available for small businesses. Um, trying to pull all the information together. I get a ton of email, I know, Mayor Washam does a, a, a lot of email from a lot of different sources, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, from the Small Business Administration, from my healthcare providers, from, from uh, Novant, uh, from Atrium. So we've tried to put that into a one-stop shop, Mecklenburg County's information as well. But one source that you can go to for all of this information, that should be up again later on today. Um, I wanna thank everybody for participating. Again, Eileen, uh, Elaine, thank you so very much. Jeff, uh, thank you for the participants who joined us uh, today. And uh, again, I hope everybody has a great day at the lake. Please, as Dan just alluded to, please continue to support our um, small businesses that are open, those essential workers, and particularly the restaurants uh, for lunch and for dinner. We've got a listing of that on our website at lakenormanchamber.org. Uh, in addition, Visit Lake Norman has a complete listing of all restaurants in Cornelius, Davidson, Huntersville, and they've created a virtual tip jar. So if you have a specific restaurant that you enjoy going to, uh, and you have a server there, they have that information up, and you can you can go ahead and tip that server so those wages are going in. We applaud what they're doing. So many more uh, things that Visit Lake Norman is putting together for our hospitality industry. And again, I wanna thank everybody for participating today, and uh, have a great day at the lake.